Welcome back to another episode of Asking 10 Questions, where we interview big names in the car community to get to know a little more about them. Today we sit down with someone every car enthusiast has watched at some point in time. Someone who is a huge automotive inspiration today. He's met with everyone from Jesse and Fast and Furious to collaborating with some of the biggest automotive YouTubers today. Starting off by reviewing his Mustang GT, he has reviewed some of the craziest car builds out there. We're hopping on a call with that dude in blue. Welcome back to another episode of Asking 10 Questions. We're here with David, AKA That Dude in Blue. Make sure to follow him on all the socials, subscribe to his YouTube if you haven't already, and then wheels, tires, suspension, Ministries.com. So, David, you ready to do this or what? Dude, I have been ready for like a week. Since you sent me the message, I was like, God, give me something to do. I'm bored at home. Let's, let's just get these questions going. I'm ready. Awesome. So we're gonna hop right into the first one. Uh, you went to film school, but may, what made you want to start a YouTube channel? Like, did you know that's what you wanted to do as a career? No. <laughs> Essentially what happened in a nutshell was uh, I went through a whole bunch of different career choices. I originally, believe it or not, wanted to be a paleontologist for dinosaur oh. stuff. Um, and then I watched the behind the scenes of Jurassic Park as a little kid. Uh -huh. And I was like, whoa, making movies looks cool. I want to do that instead now. So then I went over to that and I was like, okay, so what's the natural thing to do from here? YouTube came out on the scene, I think in 2006 or 2005, somewhere in there. And I started uploading these really awful special effects videos. You know, like me practicing, you know, like lightsaber fights and stuff like that. Sure, sure. And, uh, and I was just getting the hang of what editing was like and everything. And I was like, okay, I really dig this. I want to go into film school. So as I'm going to film school, I realized that working on set really isn't that fun for me. It, it just wasn't my thing. I was just standing around and you know putting up lights or I was the sound guy holding the boom microphone the whole time. And so I was like, this is gonna be my life. You know, like, so <laughs> I was just thinking about it and you know, coincidentally at the same time, I was going to this skate park in Virginia Beach almost every day. And this kid at the kiosk where, you know, you sign the waiver and do all that. Uh, he was like, hey, I like your car. How come I haven't seen you at the car stuff? I was like, car stuff? Where's the car stuff? And he goes, well, there's a meet right down the street. And also there's a cars and coffee tomorrow morning and blah, blah, blah. And I had been into cars, but I hadn't been around enthusiasts, if that makes sense. So I, did, I hadn't quite gotten a big bite yet. And so I enjoyed driving, but I hadn't learned about the other cars and everything. So we go to this nighttime car meet. Oh my God, everyone's actually pretty chill. They answered my questions. As long as you don't I like, act like you know everything, it's fine. So. Right. I go to Cards and Coffee in the morning, end up meeting kind of very close friends I'd have for the next college years, essentially, and they were my tight-knit group, and we started making car videos, and I was actually watching Matt Farah at the time uh, mm -hmm. on The Smoking Tire, and back then it was like Garage 419 or whatever it was called, and I was like, oh, I think I could do that if I just, you know, I do my homework, and I, you know, do some research, and, and plus my YouTube channel wasn't taking off in the short film side of things. So, right. I'll like, so I'll order some stuff on Amazon, I'll grab a suction cup, put it on my windshield, and I'll just try it, right? Why not? What's it gonna hurt? And uh, I just reviewed my own car, because, <laughs> uh, you know, why not? It's all you've had. <laughs> so I did it, I put it up, and it was just perfect timing, like the stars aligned, because I was one year away from graduating, mm -hmm. and also when I put the video up, it was right before the Coyote Mustang came out. And I was driving the eh, three point, you know, the four point six liter three valve, and you know I was gonna do a comparison. I was like, okay, I'm getting this car, um, and then I'm gonna trade this one in, and then I guess I'll review the Coyote when it comes out because why not? And both videos got quite a bit of viewership for 2012. You know, getting like 30,000 views at your first time out was a pretty big deal. And so, oh, definitely, I'm, I'm on to something. So I just kept doing it and then a friend of mine entrusted me to drive his piece of junk 350z like this thing the subframe was cracking on it like it was a terrible car the um, plastic like, two-tone one yes that's the yeah. one so he was my he's one of my best friends i've ever had and he literally i remember he was we were hanging out at a friend's house and he just threw me the keys he goes you know what you look bored go review my car and i was <laughs> like what he goes yeah do whatever you want i'm like wow okay and so i did that and uh, then I literally just was like, 
the day I graduated, you know, I'm in my corny cap and gown and everything and I walk off and I end up asking my parents, hey, can I live with you for a little bit? You know, uh, I'll, I'll get rid of the apartment I have in Virginia Beach. I'll move back to Richmond, Virginia and sure. just hermit in my office and just edit and grind every day and try and make it work. And back then you had to apply to be part of the partner program. So I got denied the Google partner program twice. <laughs> and then I applied one more time and I finally got it. And this is back when they sent you physical checks, like these giant physical checks to the point they couldn't even fit in an ATM. Yeah. Oh so my God. In, it looks like one of those really cheesy giveaways where it's like, look, you yeah. won this many and nobody, I, I walked into like my bank and they're like, this isn't real. I'm like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> and so I, I remember my first YouTube check ever, I bought like lowering springs and that was like my first install or whatever. Oh, hell yeah. You know? So I, I learned reinvestment real quick. You know, it was just one of those things where if I stuck with it and people saw that I was responsible with their vehicles and I wasn't a complete moron, you know, then mm -hmm. people would start trusting me. And uh, later down the road, cars got faster and faster and faster. And eventually that kind of unfortunately deteriorated some people emailing me or, or stop people from emailing me because they're like oh my god it has to be a rocket ship for him to drive it you know it's like right oh, right yeah, fine give me anything but long long-winded answer uh the answer <laughs> no, is no i did not expect it but i'm very fortunate that i ended up here for sure that that is super cool what an awesome story and like to be inspired by jurassic park and now yeah. i've just seen that you released the jurassic park vehicle review oh, like this. i know like I so was cool freaking out when i was <laughs> driving that thing and you know it's a 92 explorer you know it's, yeah it's got the terrible dead zone in the steering and like because you're thinking to yourself, you're like giving it a little bit of slack because you're like, well, it was supposed to be on an automated track at the park. So, right, right. <laughs> but yeah, it was an amazing opportunity and actually uh, drove a replica of the Pizza Planet truck too. too. Yeah, I see that. That's so yeah. cool. So, we, we also talked a little bit about some of your first videos. One of your first automotive videos was eight years ago already. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> what have you learned? everything um i mean i think the number one rule i would say if you're trying to do anything like this is don't try to be somebody you're not i think when i first started i tried to have this kind of sense of over professionalism because if you think about it at the time it was matt farah Roth ready who was running from the police every video i couldn't do that and <laughs> and also Motor Trend, Edmonds, like legitimate magazines. And so if I felt as though if I was gonna be taken seriously, I should have this kind of sense of like, I'm a journalist or whatever, right? But then I realized with me being in the more tuner culture or, or muscle car, whatever you wanna call it, um, the, the entire car community, you know, if you're in the car community and you're not a journalist looking from the outside in, just be yourself. And once I loosened up, I think, and I I know I'm kind of a dorky dude. So the, the moment I realized that people didn't mind me being a little geeky or a little dorky, you know, it was just one of those things where people, I think they can see through the screen that somebody's being real and it's not just like a front. And so you'll notice if you go back to like 2012, 2013, even parts of 2014, I'm like, this is a so-and-so. <laughs> and it's just like, ugh. Um, but yeah, but once I started driving the, uh, the higher horsepower stuff, I think that's when my, myself kind of started to come out more because sure. you can't hold a front. <laughs> like when you're driving something that fast, your real self is going to come out. So yeah, that's probably my best answer for that. So you said that your family's 2002 Mustang is kind of what started your passion for cars. Yeah. What else was there? So, There's gotta uh, be more. Okay. So I would say the number one reason it's the most stereotypical early 2000s thing to say is not even fast and furious it was need for speed underground yes uh, yes because because what happened was i remember so vividly i went over to a friend's house and uh we were like out in his backyard on his trampoline or whatever and he's like oh it starts to rain he goes hey i just got this new video game you want to come in and play it you, you throw it on freaking Lil John, the East Side Boys start playing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what is this? You know, like, 
because you could kind of recognize the tone from the movies, right? You're like, this is like definitely the right tone. And I was so enthralled by, you know, I wasn't good at drawing. I wasn't good at anything like artsy really, right? And so taking a car and kind of making it your own arts and crafts project, you know, in, in your sense, right? And when I built that eclipse the first time in that game, or I built the, the whatever, the skylines or whatever it was in that game, I was like, you're telling me when I'm 16 years old, I can have a car and it could look different from everybody else's? Yes. You know, so I think it was like this sense of identity in a way to where I, I just liked the concept of making something your own. I think at the end of the day, even though it was a virtual video game, and I'm so glad I don't have those save files to see the tacky things I did as a you know 13 year old um, yeah. with like lightning on the side or stars oh, yeah. on the side oh, yeah. or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, I remember like the last vinyl you unlocked was like a lightning strike that would go over the whole car. And, you know, I thought that was really unique. It was the perfect timing, you know, with the Fast and Furious era and also just the tuner car culture had exploded. So I remember I wanted my first car to be a DSM. I wanted my first car to be an Eclipse or whatever. And it's just funny because I couldn't find one in Virginia that was running. Because <laughs> so you know, <laughs> my dad's like, maybe this is a sign, you know, maybe you shouldn't grab this car for your first car. Maybe it should be right. something more reliable. And, you know, he had already kind of gone through his midlife crisis and it, it was a yellow convertible, you know what I mean? Like it was, it was, yeah, he was like, all right, it's time for me to get something kind of boring. And um, yeah, he offered it to me and it, like any kid would, you might feel spoiled, but you're not going to say no. You right, know? absolutely. Yeah. I, I was nothing but fortunate. And that's when I started, the, I remember the day I drove by myself with my license, you know, it's so weird going from somebody always breathing down your neck Mm -hmm. And then finally getting to that moment where you're driving by yourself. And I'm 100%. like, oh my God, I love driving. And I remember just like the, the amount of money that I wasted in gas, like just driving the long way home or like going into the middle of the country. Like I would play this game where the get lost on purpose game, you know, like go out into the country, take a left, take a right, take a left and just take a gps home you know and yeah. so, yep. so that's what really made me love cars because you trickle it down with the need for speed underground right and mm -hmm. then eventually when you're finally in that driver's seat you're like i knew i was right i knew there was something there you know and so um and you know that culture at the time too kind of made it think that muscle cars couldn't be customizable you know so like i remember right. when i got the mustang i was like i have a mustang i mean they're they're neat but like, can I do anything? And I re I look it up and it's the most customizable car in the world, you know, at the time. And I'm like, what was I thinking? You know, and parts are cheap and I should just enjoy it, you know? And I remember doing a front grill and a lift my first time and drilling into a car my first time, seeing paint chunks come down. Oh, that's the worst. Okay, so question number four. You have influenced so many people to start automotive YouTube channels and a lot of our generation grew up watching you review cars. What advice do you have for someone that wants to do YouTube as a full-time job? Okay, I, I think a big one is just upload like just try it don't be afraid to experiment because if you think about it i went through like three youtube channels before that dude in blue took off and that right. dude in blue was a throwaway account you're like that's what i mean it's like you never know because that car video like i told you before that was an experiment i didn't know it was going to work out but i think a lot of people are so scared to not get viewership it's right. one of those things where you're gonna have to get kicked while you're down at the very beginning. It's gonna hurt. You're gonna be like, why is nobody interested? Why, you're gonna kind of psych yourself out. And eventually you will, I think, if you find your niche in the car community, one is stand out. Don't do what everything, everybody else is doing. You know, anybody could be like a daily vlogger, you know, anybody could be a car reviewer if they do their homework, right? But what makes you different from the rest of the community? And I don't mean you have to be like weird, you know, you don't have to be crazy no, no, right. Anything. But, you know, put time and quality into your work. I think a lot of a lot of YouTube and the automotive community is now a lot of people just kind of walking around with GoPros or iPhones. Mm -hmm. and, I, and people notice when people put effort into your work. I think if you take the time, you know, you don't have to rock as crazy expensive camera. That's not what I'm saying. Right. But just 
take your time, do some research, learn some film techniques, you know, use a tripod, <laughs> you know, like just little tiny things can improve your video so much to where it's not a shaky cam anymore. You know, it's not this. Just make sure that when you present a video, make sure it's not just to upload a video. Make sure there's a reason behind it. And also, what does the viewer gain from it? You know, like the dress apart truck, perfect example. Do I know that a lot of people are gonna learn a lot about it? Probably not. The thing is, is I know that video is pure nostalgia and people are probably gonna be a little intrigued about how was this car built, you know? Sure. And that's why I had the owner right next to me and told the whole story. There's no reason for me to memorize the entire thing if I don't have to, and he's the guy who did it. So why wouldn't you wanna hear from him? Um, format is important. Um, don't like, I could go on about this all day, uh, but yeah. the, ma yeah. the main thing is, is experiment, be different, and also make sure not to do it just for the views. Make sure that you're actually happy doing what you're doing because you need to think of the long game. 100%. Changing gears up a little bit. About a month ago, you uh, got to review the Porsche Taycan mm -hmm. uh, electric car. You seem to really enjoy it, but do you see car enthusiasts getting more into electric cars as time goes on? So when I got the offer, I got the email from Porsche and about, you know, it blew my mind because that's like a dream to get a press car from such a big company like that. It's like crazy. That. And, crazy. Uh, you know, and being in Atlanta, you're kind of proud because their headquarters is here. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. So that glass building that Porsche has here in Atlanta, that's the Avengers headquarters, if people don't know. Yeah. So that's where they film all the Marvel movies and stuff like that. The more um, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Nerd. <laughs> um, so, you know, they hit me up and they said, hey, we saw you made this video about electric cars and if car enthusiasts should be worried. And so it wasn't that big of a hit of a video I posted, but it was like a vlog of me driving around and just kind of discussing like, what could that impact our community, right? Sure. And so my conclusion in that video is, we'll just have to see what happens, you know, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause you go to SEMA and there's Teslas there. You're like, yep. you're like whoa, whoa, like this it's is weird. weird. And so they, I was like, well, we have the quarantine going on. How's this going to work? So they de disinfected the car. They dropped it off at my house, put the key under the welcome mat and left. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. And there's this, there's this house in my driveway now. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. For real. Um, so I just, okay. <sighs> for car enthusiasts who have never experienced something like the Taycan, I'm on your side. I get it. I understand how it can be a little intimidating. I understand that technology, we don't really know that well, because once you understand how combustion motors work, stuff that you don't know can kind of be intimidating. But getting in a car that you don't have to worry about heat soak, you don't have to worry about coolant, you don't have to worry about transmission snapping, you don't have to worry about any of this. It's like, it's so bizarre being able to launch a car a hundred plus times without worry, like I, I know for a fact, I launched that car probably a hundred times when I had it uh, because it goes zero to 60 in two and a half seconds every single time. And so there's, Insane. No, there's no wheel spin. And at the same time, you can do it until there's 50 miles left of the charge. So with Dang. Tesla's, you kind of have to do this charging dance to where you get like three launches or whatever, then you have to recharge the whole car and do it again. The Taycan is just ready to rock all the time. You know, the interior feels like a Porsche. It, the, the best thing about the Taycan is that it is a Porsche. Like, mm -hmm. like you drive it, you're like, this doesn't feel that foreign to me. You know, like if you've been in a 911, you've been in a Panamera, any of that, you're not gonna feel out of place. So you get in the car and it's amazing just the instant acceleration and the potential for car people to tune these later or figure out how to make them faster. The sky's the limit. Yeah. You look down, you're there. And it's and it made that Jetson noise. It gave you a satisfying driving experience because I think what people realize with electric cars is that it won't be satisfying to drive. The Taycan right. is satisfying to drive. Um, it's center of gravity is the best Porsche's ever really had. Uh, so it handles like a 911 it's all-wheel drive like 
it blows my mind. I remember somebody messaged me. They said, yeah, but it's not ever going to be as fun as my car I have. I go, how much time you got? I can talk about it all day. You know, and, but I got back in my combustion cars and I was hunky dory. You know, I was happy. Um, but people should not be scared of electric cars. I'll just end it on that. It's going to be fun. Just if you can get in a Taycan for God's sake, please do it. You will not regret it. You've reviewed everything from Jasmine the Evo 8 to Marcia Lagos and twin turbo Gallardos to even more recently a big turbo Volvo 8. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to make you pick your favorite car that you reviewed because I feel like that's too hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what in your eyes constitutes a great car build? Okay. Surprisingly, first, reliability. Uh, it, it doesn't, it sounds kind of weird, but almost every crazy dumb fast I've ever driven has gone through multiple motors, you know, like multiple trans. So when I drive the cars, yeah, they're fast, but I'm like, how long does this last? You know, how, how much fun can I squeeze? If I were to own this car, like right. what's the ownership experience going to be like? I think a positive ownership experience is the best thing about a car. Uh, that way people get the most seat time out of it. Um, Jasmine went through four engines, you know, it's like, it's what, and those are not cheap built engines, you know, so you look at it and you're like, oh, I wouldn't want to own that because of so-and-so. Um, but I think engaging, it sounds good. And also a balance of power of straight line speed and handling. It seems like 500 on the street is I think I have the most fun in five to 600. Like once you, I, my line has always been, once you hit 700, the world changes. <laughs> like that's where everything starts to really get a little like airy. Mm -hmm. um, like I drove a 750 horsepower MR2 last year <laughs> and yes. it was the stock engine. It was the stock turbo engine. Um, and it was amazing. But you know, for a fact that one day that thing could jump up and bite you, you know, and you're like, I don't know. So 500, usually you can have fun in, you can accelerate, you can break soon enough, you know, and that way you can just really enjoy the experience. Plus, usually you're not pushing reliability standards if you're doing like that kind of build. If you have an Evo turned down for like 550, oh my God, it's so great, you know? So um, yeah, in the end, reliability, seat time, and just an overall good package you know a car that treats its owner right let's just say that question number seven you've been through a lot and i give you so much credit david uh from college and film school from moving from virginia to georgia just a lot of stuff everything in between you somehow always manage to have a smile on your face uh with everything going on right now what advice do you have for staying positive it's funny you say that because my girlfriend calls me frustratingly optimistic. <laughs> yeah, we wear the balance of power. Um, yeah. But honestly, I think the best way to look positive during this moment, if you're stuck at home, um, is realize what you're going to do once you're free. Uh, like the way I look at it is this is a perfect time to plan out car stuff plan out kind of maybe you want to do a project car right make a budget make a parts list look for wheels <laughs> look for stuff like that be like what what is my dream car right now go on freaking forza build it you know or whatever and be like this is my goal because after that you can be like okay now i'm getting back to normal i'm gonna go back to work and then just make a little bit of an account just for fun car stuff you know and in that way, you have something to look forward to. I think that's what a lot of people are kind of missing right now, including me. I mean, I had a ton of film shoots canceled on me. I was going to travel a ton this year. Right. Um, and just like, you know, you break yeah. it right up, you know. So I think is take this time to kind of find what experiences you want to do after this is all over. Okay, so moving on to our final three questions, we're rotating to subscriber questions. These are questions from our subscribers that wanna hear from you. So our first one is Cap City Trap Star 804. He wants to know, being from Virginia, I'm curious how you feel the car scene is in Virginia versus Georgia as far as the types of cars you see most often and that good stuff. Okay, so I have a pretty simple answer is it's the scale. So Virginia has a much in my opinion, a more tight knit community. Everybody knows each other. 
Um, everybody from Richmond and Virginia Beach kind of knows each other because it's only like two hours apart. So like we would drive two hours to go to a car meet in Virginia Beach because the meet wasn't big enough in Richmond, you know? So <laughs> yeah. go there, hang out for the night, go to the beach or whatever, go to the skate park or whatever, hang out and then drive back, you know? So it's it's really tight of a community and, every, and people help each other out. But um, the police there, I'm not hating on the police there, but they're right, way right. more strict in Virginia. Um, gotcha. Motorsports is not in Virginia's blood. Let's just say that. <laughs> um, they do not appreciate people like us as much. Uh, so uh, it's it's a it's harder to have a bigger seat there because gotcha. even if you have permission from a place, it doesn't matter. They'll show <laughs> up and kick you out anyway. So I think yeah. by the time I left, that's what was so frustrating. Was one I was just kind of running out of stuff to film. Um, and at the same time, we were just, it was just getting harassed at one point, pretty much. So I, uh, I came down for Import Alliance in Atlanta every year. And I was like, Atlanta has 18,000 cars at their cars and coffee alone every month. The head you know, is so like, nuts. 18,000 oh people. That sounded way too crazy. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. But still, it's a lot of people. Yeah, um, and bigger Import than the Alliance, population. Import Alliance at 60,000 last year. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of car enthusiasts. So, yeah. So the way I looked at it was, you know what? Atlanta feels a lot like Virginia. It's still on the East Coast. You got Southern hospitality. People are pretty nice here. And along with that, uh, the car community has a lot more variety. Uh, cool. Richmond and Virginia Beach, you, tons of the Honda, like Honda scene. Richmond has tons of crazy fast Hondas. Um, that's when I finally had faith in civics, really. You know what I mean? Like right. when I was starting to go to the meets and people were getting dogged by civics, I was like, okay, I get it now. <laughs> you know, so I started finding love for that side of things uh, in Virginia Beach and in Richmond. But then I come down here and you have everything. It's more of the population density gives you more opportunities to see kind of neater stuff. Um, and so I think that's, the main reason why I moved down here. Cool. Uh, Kevin is curious and he's wondering about the other side of the world. Uh, what car impressed you the most during your trip to Puerto Rico? And what did you think about the car culture on that small Caribbean island? Puerto Rico, that's one of my favorite video series I've ever made uh, because the amount of hospitality I got in Puerto Rico was unbelievable i mean really? i showed up and people were just like want to drive my car want to drive my car we love you <laughs> i was like i've never seen people so willing to like let's make videos so yeah yeah we timed it perfectly because i was like okay i want to make a documentary about the car scene in puerto rico because i see them destroy people in drag racing here in the states you know mm -hmm. and so i was like i want to see where that stuff comes from my girlfriend's originally from there so we have a fluent speaker perfect so we get there and um, I would say some of the craziest cars I saw there were the rotary swap Suzuki Samurais. Those oh, that is cool. With the <laughs> yeah. cars in the back. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> we rode we rode in um, my girlfriend's dad's childhood best friend's car. Uh, it was a old Toyota Corolla mm -hmm. with a Toyota Tacoma engine in it. What with the a hell? Big turbo on it, and it made like 150 <laughs> horse. And, That's awesome. And the car weighed like 1,600 pounds. Hell yeah. So, so if you go back and watch that video, I call it the UN meeting because Yvonne, the owner, doesn't have great English. So he would talk to me and then, or he would talk to Alejandra and then Alejandra would talk to me. So sure. we just made it this circle, you know, of us talking. But it just shows how tight knit the car community is around the world. It doesn't yeah. really matter. Um, but I drove, oh yeah, I drove a really weird crossfire when I was down there. Uh, it was the SRT6. Yeah, I, I've never really looked. I don't think they're particularly pretty cars, but no, it, just, it was just unique to drive a fast RT, you know, SRT six. Yeah, um, yeah. But no, like uh, lots of cars we don't have here. You know, they had a ton of stuff we didn't have, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like the older Evos were there. Uh, oh, that's so cool. Uh, yeah, really, really. But the Mazdas, man, they dominate that island. The rotaries yeah. dominate that island. So, so it's interesting. Super cool. It's super cool to see people do it right. Yeah, you know, do the rotaries right. Because a lot of people here don't. They just For sure, yeah. Figure it out. Okay, so coming on to our last question here. Uh, I think a lot of people associate your name with Grabber Blue from Ford, not that your name yeah. came from uh, what you were wearing while reviewing movies and stuff. Uh, yeah. 
Rail Helen asks, do you have a favorite shade of blue? Grabber. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because if you were to go back, circling all the way back, if you were mm -hmm. to go back to my Need for Speed cars, almost all the cars are blue. Like, <laughs> well, or if you go into my Forza garage, it's like black, white, and blue. Um, yep, yep. Um, it's just always been kind of the color scheme. And um, it just it is funny because where the whole joke came from was I went to that skate park one day and I was wearing a yellow shirt. Mm -hmm. And I sat down next to somebody I saw almost every day. And they said, dude, I thought David was coming up today. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm right here. And he goes, oh my God, I didn't recognize you. I was like, what do you mean? You're not wearing blue. And so I was like, okay. So it became, it really became an inside joke because I was part of an online movie club. Yep, um, yep. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, it's because Philip DeFranco's mm -hmm. movie club uh, gave me that dude a blue name. And so I just stuck with it. Um, and now my freaking closet is just an ocean. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you walk in, it's just like, ah, all blue. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny when I, if I just need to be left alone at a car meet, I take off my hat and put on a different color. <laughs> like, and you're like invisible. Off the, off the Harry Potter invisibility. <laughs> yeah. um, like in Port Alliance, it's so funny. As soon as they take off my hat, it's like I'm not even there. there. It's so <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you so much, David. And again, go follow and subscribe that dude in blue. Wheels, tire, suspension, fitministries.com. Thank you so much, man. No problem, I had a great time.